yummy. Sell, if you try to sell them as kittens, like the society will come and like hunt you down and like buy all the kittens from you. Because they like really so want to have a pet. monopoly. They do. They have a monopoly. Oh. They want to like a compressed couch. They want to like protect the integrity. But there's too many guys making money off of so the creatures. So that they don't like get in bed. Okay. That's fascinating. <laughs> Let's, let's review Pedicus. <laughs> let's review Pedicus. Okay, so I thought we would might quickly finish up the one about health and hygiene and then go on from there. Um, okay, I think we're on number nine. Number nine? Number nine? Yes. Number nine? Sorry, that's a Beatles reference. You should get that. Number nine? Isn't that the one you pointed out? No, the White Album. Anyway, this disorder is frequently caused by singing with too high an air pressure and too many glottal onsets. Um, it's the it's the answer du jour, not a I was gonna say not jour. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this disorder is characterized by vocal fatigue, painful phonation, <laughs> ding 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 ding. That's the important one, and persistent reoccurrence of symptoms even after rest. That's also Primarily caused by overly low pitched speaking mm -hmm. voice and too many glottal onsets. No, ma'am, I'm sorry. Is that the granuloma then? That's the granuloma. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. the granuloma, remember, is not so much the vocal fold, it's the arytenoid cartilages. So my vocal fold, you know, is going that away, and my little arytenoid cartilages, if you remember, you know, all the little muscles that make them pivot around. So, when you do a hard glottal onset, I have to kind of wash my hands here. Your arytenoid cartilages are, you're pressing your arytenoid cartilages together, okay? And they tend to kind of wiggle around a little bit, you know, because your air pressure building up and they're having to, you know, hold things together there against that pressure. And so, they will kind of torque against each other and so you'll get this, you know, just like uh, you get a bed sore, you know, from having the same s soft part of your body, you know, bearing weight or be having pressure on it. Same thing here. You've got this chronic pressing together of tissue and it's getting rubbed and rather than building up a callus like other tissues might, you actually just get like this ulcerated kind of spot. How do they fix that one? Well, uh, the granuloma, if they're really, 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 really big, first they're gonna do voice therapy. And if things are not, um, if they're responding to voice therapy, but it's still, I think, to the size that they need to do something on a surgical level, they will, but they're gonna do voice therapy first. Um, because it's a habit that has, uh, we have a mosquito flying around in the other side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a mosquito yes, kind of flying right around. Um, so anyway, <laughs> so anyway, um, where was it going? Yeah. So the granuloma, you know, they're going to try therapy. They're going to try behavior modification because it's the behavior that got you there in the first place. Just like with nodules, you know, the standard treatment for nodules and the granuloma, because those are chronic behavior driven kind of things is voice therapy. Something that's a, a one time trauma, you know, like you cough, scream, sneeze, and you have a hemorrhage, or you a polyp, you know, from coughing and things like that, those are things they're gonna do a surgery on because it's um, it's not so much caused by your chronic behavior. It's not like doing therapy Granted, doing therapy is, is good for a lot of people for a lot of reasons, but something where you've got you know a, a injury that occurred because of a one-time event, you know, a really hard cough or getting intubated or um, screaming, those kinds of things. That's the kind of thing they're going to more likely do the surgical intervention as the first step, and then. You know, they might follow up with some post-surgery therapy. But the granuloma, you know, and the cyst is, is one that they're going to probably, they'll either leave it alone or they will, you know, 
go in and remove it if it's a big one. With the cyst, is that also caused by, like? Typically a cyst is, you've probably um, had a, 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 an injury on the body of the fold rather than on the edge. It's more in the body of the fold. You know, you might have had uh, a big varix, a big um, varicose vein kind of thing. Okay. Um, and it might have ruptured and you got this thing and then your tissue kind of grew around and over it. So, because a cyst has a, yeah. So it's a not cyst, a usage, it's not a, a usage problem. No, generally not. Okay, so generally that's something you not. Also yeah, because a cyst will impair the vibratory motion of the right. nodule. So why would they ever suggest CV fix a granuloma or a nodule with surgery if they know that if it's just therapy and it's okay, it's probably going to come back? Well, I mean, they're going to start with therapy and see how, provided that you know your respiration and your basic function is not so grossly impaired, and mm -hmm. typically those things don't, you know. Um, they're gonna make sure that you're on the way to, to having better habits, and then, okay, this thing is so big, it's just not responding, or we're concerned about, like with a nodule, that, you know, the, um, because they're always worried about scarring. Right. You know, because especially something right. on the margin of the vocal fold, the very edge, you don't wanna, you're, you're hesitant to do surgery there because of scarring, which might permanently alter the, the movement of the tissue. Can people get chemoids on their vocal folds? Can people get what? Chemoids? It's chemoids. like scar tissue that like swells. I don't know. I don't Cause like know. Because like anytime I get cut or like if I have to get stitches, I always get chemoids. Huh. So I've always wondered that. So. Um, okay. In general, you know, they're really trying to to do as much as they can without having to do surgery. Polyps, a big polyp, a small polyp they'll often leave alone. Yeah. I mean, a, a very small one, they'll leave alone, rest, steroids, gentle return to voice use, and knowing that they just have to kind of monitor that. Um, a big polyp, um, laryngeal cancer, of course, okay. large cysts, um, those kinds of things are gonna operate on. When they go in for knee surgery, do they do it like they go in with a scope or do they cut, like physically cut? They will get them? you in a position like this typically and they have these very long, um, Ooh, like what? they have these very long instruments that right. can do tiny, tiny little movements on the end. And then yes, they do have a scope in and they're watching while they're doing it, obviously. Um, I don't obviously know, because I've not experienced it, and those are beyond the scope of this class. It's great curiosity on your part. Yes, you can go ahead. Okay, overfunction of this gland lowers the pitch of your voice and coarsens the quality of the sound. Thyroid. Thyroid, yep. Symptoms of this hormonal change include vocal fatigue, hoarseness, loss of range, vocal cord swelling, and breathiness. Hormonal change. So is that the mm -hmm. the heat lubricant? Mm, no. Mm, no. 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 Yeah. Menstruation. Your menstruation. Yeah. No puberty fall women. No, like each month. No, at each yeah. month. Yeah, yeah. Have you never noticed, like, on your period, you're like, why, why is my voice sad? Like, no, you know, mm -hmm. when you go to the bathroom, you're like, Bubbles. well, it's going to last for two days, I don't give a shit. Okay, and that happens. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. That's just a little more information than I need right now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's you I have mean, a wife who's a singer. I, it's yeah. not like that. And I have to say, happens. if you're going to be teaching people um, as a singing teacher, there are delicate ways you can ask questions. You know, like a person comes in and their voice isn't terribly responsive and you say, you know, if I may ask, is this kind of a, a bad week for you? You know, and they'll, yes, you know, 
something like that, or just like, is this is this your period this week? You know, I mean, yeah, if it's somebody, about yeah, <laughs> if, you know, it depends on your level of comfort that you've well, established. I think she's too. also a woman. I was well, like, your female instructions will typically be a little bit more comfortable more asking about it. Yes, and depending on how blunt you are, your you know, oh, if you have a student that's very kind of, you might put it the first exactly. week you did it, a bad week. Exactly. But if you have a student you're close with, be like, are you on your period? And they'll be like, yes. Yeah. No. And I mean, as a male instructor, I always just say, you know, look, my wife's a singer. I'm married. You know, I know, I, I, I know what's going on here. You know, so um, okay, this hormone and others like it can cause permanent changes in a woman's vocal folds, thickening and stiffening connective tissues and altering the range downward. Testosterone. Testosterone. Yep. yep. <laughs> and um, you know, there are times where Say a person is is uh, has had say cancer surgery, um, uh, you know, cervical or um, uterine or ovarian or breast cancer, and they are on hormones that are you know estrogen suppressing hormones. Well, they will typically up your your testosterone level. But you know, the doctor's trying to save your life. Is that why after chemotherapy, a lot of times people can't sing anymore? I wouldn't say can't sing anymore, but their voice might be changed. Yeah. Yeah, and radiation, radiation for head and neck cancers can can have some pretty serious side effects mm -hmm. on your voice. Yeah, but those are things that you know you're working with your medical team, mm -hmm. and all those options are being considered. But you know, saving your life is the first thing at that point. Now I know why my brother was stressed out. Just like um, okay, one early symptom of this disorder is a lowered basal body temperature. Your basal body temperature is just like your natural. Your waking, your, your waking body temperature. And that is No. Is it hypothyroidism? Hypothyroidism, yeah. And hypo is where it does. You know, not enough. Not enough. Hyper is me. Right. Hundred times a month. So, so your temperature in the morning would be much. It would be lower than normal. I believe that. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Both now, how would you so know? Good. Well, if you take your temperature every morning, you know, there's, I wrote an article about body monitoring things for singing. Um, and I talk about everything from, you know, you know, a, a diet diary and an exercise diary and kind of a, you know, a daily diary journaling kind of things, taking your body temperature, women tracking their cervical mucus and, and you know, I mean, all sorts of crazy things. You can, you can do a lot. You can do a lot. And, and it helps you predict, you know, what's going on. Yeah. Okay, elevating the head and shoulders, eating several hours before bedtime or singing, avoiding caffeine, acidic foods, milk and dairy products, and alcohol, all tips for avoiding what? Acid reflux. Acid reflux. Yes, indeed. And uh, again, you know, your physicians, if you go to a doctor, uh, it depends on your doctor. You know, some doctors will say, okay, they're going to ask you, have you tried X, Y, Z, you know, behavioral things. Other doctors are going to be, okay, well, here, you know, here's, you can go buy some over-the-counter Prilosec or Nexium or whatever. Okay. Yeah, are antacids, like, bad for, do they affect the voice in any way? Um, no, in fact, they're some of the most commonly prescribed medications by laryngologists because practically everybody at one time or another does reflux, um, especially as we age or if we're overweight um, or our diet is kind of wonky or you're under stress. I mean, your, your stomach will produce more acid when you're dealing with anxiety and stress and things like that. Um, and you'll feel your stomach kind of churning and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we all know that sensation. And your stomach is producing more acid. So, yeah. Um, this surgical procedure involves placing a flexible tube between the vocal folds into the trachea. Intubation? Intubation, yep. And that's the reason why if you're having surgery and you know you're going to have surgery, not you're on you're in, the, you're in the ER and unconscious. If you're in the ER and unconscious, hopefully a family member is there and can say, if there's any way that you need to intubate 
my sweetie, my husband, my brother, my sister, whatever, because they're a singer, you know, then please be very gentle on the intubation. What requires intubation? Because I've had surgery, when I had surgery, though it was very short surgery, like all I had was like a mask over yeah. my face. So yeah. what requires? Well, if you're gonna be, um, you're gonna be completely sedated. Um, I mean, I had a colonoscopy a year and a half ago, and when they do a colonoscopy, they do what's called, um, <coughs> they call it, um, waking sedation, so mm -hmm. I don't remember any of it, or I have just like two or three little glimmers of memory of it. He was talking to me. He told me, he said, no, we, we were having a nice conversation. He says, you weren't making a whole lot of sense, but. Uh. <laughs> <coughs> and I mean, my wife told me in the recovery room, I said some things like four times. Okay. It's like when I watched them. But yeah, that was just intravenous. And. Um, but you said that you had told them right. pediatric to turn up the oxygen. And that's that is what I. That's what, what I. What you recommend? Well, you want them using a smaller tube. Yeah. Because the bigger the tube, the more likelihood there could be of, you know, your um, right. privileges. But, you know. <coughs> if someone's a larger person, they could be more oxygen. So would you not recommend that for someone who's larger? I am not an anesthesiologist. But it's, I, it's a discussion. If you're having elective surgery, right. that you, you know, because the anesthesiologist will come in and they will talk with you. Or you make a point of asking to see that person. And you just say, okay, look, I'm a singer. I'm concerned about this. And, you know, I know a lot of people who don't take any risks. And they will put singer on their forehead, you know, because that anesthesiologist might have six Denying. surgeries that they're doing that day, and okay, now, is this the one that the person talked to me about, you know, so you just want to look out for yourself, because we have had a singer who attended this school who had a very mild um, arrhythmoid dislocation as a result of intubation, mm -hmm. and Dr. Simpson looked at the student and said, you know, probably going to resolve itself, you know. She was having post-surgical wackiness, and he looked at her and said, yeah, you know, one of your annoyed cartilages is a little bit funky, and that was why. But it it managed to straighten itself back out, and everything was fine. Okay. 17. Washing your hands frequently with soapy water and keeping them away from your nose, your mouth, and your eyes are the best way to avoid a lot of upper respiratory illnesses. And then number 18. Does specifically be upper respiratory illness? <coughs> any, any of those things. Getting, getting sick for that work. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I have a cough drop, but I'm hesitant to take it because I took one yesterday afternoon and it made me cough more. Actually, um, they're kind of <coughs> old, but I actually have the throat soothers that are just pectin. Yes, so perfect. So I know they're like year old, but they still work. <laughs> you are the bomb. I love these because the menthol drives me crazy after a while. Thank you. Uh, oh yes, I'm feeling the love. <laughs> yeah, eighteen is. You just answered it. Um, no, you just answered. I know, but you just answered 18 as well. What's 18? What's it to do with 18 is the question for 17. Oh, wash your hands frequently. Well, okay, the best thing to do when you have one, excuse me. What's the best thing to do when you have one? That's kind of overreacting. I think that sounds like a really good idea. So, steam is good because it helps um, moisturize tissues that might be irritated. Um, hydration, it's gonna help you fix
thin your mucus so that <coughs> you fought less and um, rest. Let your body recover. And that includes some vocal rest. I mean, I haven't sung the last two days. condition is generally caused by bacteria marked by swollen or inflamed tonsils and lymph glands in the neck. Tonsillitis. This condition, viral or bacterial, well, you can read it, red swollen folds, weak, husky, or non-existent speaking voice. Laryngitis. Laryngitis, yeah. of the vocal folds, extrinsic, intrinsic muscles, respiratory muscles, and thickened mucus are some of the results of this. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, nodules is not the answer. Uh, Muscles. You ever get out of a coral muscle and you're like, man, my side and my back hurts. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then what typically happens too is we get dehydrated because you're transpiring a lot of moisture when you're blowing it all out like that. And your mucus gets thick because you're dehydrated. That's the next thing. So, yeah, just overuse. Uh, very dynamic speak singing, avoiding extreme notes for all techniques for this type of rehearsing. Marking? Marking. Yeah, so you don't sing full out. You might, okay, so you're working on the walking, okay, and so I sing. You know, just kind of speaking through it at a lower pitch level. Or, yeah, you, you sing high notes down and some of the really low notes you might bring them up an octave or something. A consistent program of testing voices on an individual basis, essential to maintaining a healthy choral program. This is in order to avoid what? So you're testing them often. Right, putting them on the wrong part or keeping them on a part that is no longer appropriate. So, you know, that flexible idea of, you know, they need to go ahead and move up or move down. Perfect example. Um, Brooke Holyoke, who is now at Macomb High School, was here. And she was doing, she had been singing kind of light lyric mezzo kind of stuff. And uh, she had done a recital, and at this time, you could continue to study voice after you had finished a recital.
recital basically until you graduate. She had several more semesters to go. She was studying with me at that point, and we were moving up. And so I talked to Dr. Salanti and I said, you know, she's reporting to me that the alto part in choir really is fatiguing her. And I said, can we move her up to second, you know, in choir? And he was like, absolutely. He says, we're, no, we're right about to go out on tour, you know, and I really need her there. But as soon as we come back from tour, absolutely. So, you know, he was very amenable to the feedback he was getting from me. And it made all the difference in the world. You know, a month later, she was like, oh, gosh, I feel so much better. I don't feel so tired when I come out of choir. Because it was the wrong tessitura. Um, OK, the single most important trait. I don't know. Let, I won't ask that question. So just because is there a single most? Let's name some important traits about. Let's look at it that way. Important traits of young voices when we're training them. Things to remember. Uh, <coughs> how we're going to be breathy. OK. Let's write them on the board. And there's no chalk. What kind no. of a teaching room is this? <laughs> no tier chalk. One. A tier one. All the way. <laughs> OK. Well, we'll just talk about them. So. Say it again. There's going to be breathier. It's going to be breathy. Changing voice. They're going to be changing, so you have to be open to the idea of, okay, they need to switch parts. Their endurance is not what ours is. That's probably one of the most important things to remember. They're going to fatigue quickly. What else? Danielle, pick one. Mm -hmm. Just think back to when you were that. Yeah, it's not that, as mature. Yeah, that's true, and um, emotionally, and also, they'll have days they come in just like my voice just doesn't feel good. I just, mm -hmm. you know, they're like, I don't want to sing today. It just doesn't feel good. Okay, another one. They don't have a sense of control. Yeah, yeah. When your voice, you know, when the physiology and anatomy of your voice is changing so much, it's going to be variable from day to day your ability to reliably produce that same quality. Yeah. And yeah, um, in terms of their ability to do, you know, delicate, soft, or really forte, you know, maybe kind of out the window. Um, the middle ground might work pretty reliably. And think about times when um, you're coming off of a cold or something like that, and your voice basically is is okay, but you you can't quite do the really finesse things that you normally could do, and your voice isn't quite feeling as strong as it normally does, you know. So just think of your kids as they're in that instability kind of thing, just like you might be if you were had been had a long layoff, or you know you've been sick or both. Okay. All right. Good stuff. Good technique plus this can be as destructive to laryngeal muscles as poor technique. The technique plus poor speaking voice? That's one, absolutely. Overuse. Overuse. What else? So you can have great technique, but if you do something else, it undermines everything. And she said, Bad habits with your speaking voice, you said overuse. Singing when you're sick. Singing when you're sick. What about the repertoire? Oh. Uh. So you might have great technique that you've established with <coughs> doing all sorts of great exercises and whatever, but if you're singing the wrong kind of music for your voice, that can undermine everything that's going on can undermine everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Vocal irritation.
irritants in society. Let's let's name a few. Smoking. Smoking. What were you gonna say? Smog. Smog. Like pollution in big cities. Um, no. Noise pollution. Yeah, they right. Shout over. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that makes you work harder. Okay. So both pollution in a city and um, smoking. Those are particulates. Okay. And those are, you know, tissue irritants. Um, of course, and they go down in your lungs too, you know. <coughs> Bad weather. Bad weather, how so? Like cold wind. Um, so not particulate, it's allergens. Okay, allergens, which again are particulate. You know, those are tiny, tiny little particles. Uh, the man next to you on the bus who wears way too much aftershave. Or the woman who stands next to you in community choir who wears way too much <laughs> perfume. <laughs> and those are. They're not, well, they might be irritating it, to you vocally. They certainly, the smells are. Um, or sick people. Maybe. Yeah. So. Germ factory. Germ. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the big things we've talked about, <laughs> noise and either pollution generated by a person smoking or pollution because of industrial and cars and things like that. Also, if you live in and the allergens. Like, this part of Texas, or I guess a little more south, is the Kansas Belt, where all the power plants are, and then you're just like, I've seen chemicals. Like weird chemicals are burning. Yeah. Well, oh yes. You haven't heard that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Houston, yeah. Louisiana, it's the Kansas Belt. Because well, well, there's a lot of there's a lot of refineries. There's a lot of uh, yeah. along the Mississippi and along the Gulf Coast. Especially sulfur. In, in um, yeah. Louisiana, I know people who go to LSU for voice, and when they're like, I can't see anymore, it gets all the sulfur. And oh, sulfur, oh. again, you know, <clears throat> sulfur is another part of industrial pollution. Yeah. Um, but cleaning chemicals? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Whenever I clean my shower, I have to. A lot of those aerosols? <clears throat> yeah. You really should protect yourself. Or you work with bleach, especially. And when your nose yeah. burns, Fumes. you burn it all So we're years. talking about. And I start coughing. Yeah. You know, gasoline, uh, nail polish remover, you know, any of those um, volatile organics, paint thinner, you know, sprays, I mean, even like your spray deodorant and stuff, the propellant in those is usually propane. Because you can take a lighter yeah. and a lot of those things, <laughs> and it's like a flamethrower. Believe me, I, I found that out at camp one time. Um, <laughs> bug sprays, bless you. Thank you. Bug sprays. So all of those things that are spray, um, those kind of things, or you know, being around solvents that you might use to um, take off paint or clean off grease and things like that, paint thinner, uh, lacquer thinner, um, I don't know about turpentine, but those are the kind of things you want to protect your voice, so if you're, if you're doing that kind of stuff, do it outdoors, if at all possible. If not, have the ventilation flowing through the room and you stand so that the fumes are going away from you, so that you've got flow going that way so that it goes out, because you just don't want to be breathing that stuff. I worked as an undergraduate in a lab, and I was around toluene, which is, you know, it's refined. It's, it's, it's a, a uh, when you refine petroleum, it's one of, the, one of the things that you can get off from petroleum. And we were using it as a solvent they would put these little discs of samples of tissue and stuff on it and then they would have I was also around radioactive radioactive material um, sulfur 32 and uh, uh, tritium yeah anyway um, because they were used in uh, DNA testing and things you, you have radiological markers but you know I was always lab coat gloves, working in a fume hood, and those kind of things, and wearing a, radi a radiation badge. 
because um, that was standard safety protocol. But I still, to this day, I think, well, what all was I exposed to, you know? That was back in the 80s, you know? Yeah. Can we have another one of those cough drops? Yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling much better now. And you might notice I have not coughed yeah, yet. Yeah. Yeah, You're my savior. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, she wore, like, a piece of Air travel, let's go. <coughs> Air travel. Air travel and singers. Some of the drawbacks. Germ factory. Germ factory. Jet lag. Jet lag, big time. Hydration. Yeah. hydration, because they don't hydrate the air. Do you know how the air comes into the plane? It gets sucked in through the engines. Sucked in through the engines. What? Yeah. Yep. They actually have these masks you can buy called mm -hmm. humidifiers. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, they're really expensive. I have one, but you can buy them in a pack of 10, and then they're $40 per person. So they're not as expensive as you buy them in bulk. Well, I think a better way is just drink a lot of water. You know, have an empty water bottle in your carry-on stuff, and then you fill it up at a water fountain. Of course, then you have to go back to that tiny little bathroom and pee. And if you're a claustrophobe, that's, that's another problem. Or a germaphobe. Or a germaphobe. <laughs> what about circulation and circulation? Well, right. On long flights, uh, deep vein thrombosis, particularly in uh, older people, because you're sitting in the seats for long times. So and they, they have those little exercises you can do, and they're not a bad idea. Um, how about the noise? Yeah. I mean, if you don't speak, if you burst a nose. Right. Or but if you've got a seat like by a window or by a well, engine, it should be pretty loud. By the engines, especially on the planes, you know, where the engines are towards the back of the plane and you're right next to it. In fact, we were flying back from Louisville and I was right next to the engine. And I looked at my son before we got going and I said, I'm just not gonna talk because it's gonna be so loud. He's like, Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> he read his book, I read my book. You just don't want to talk over the noise. I mean, the same is true of, you know, going to a nightclub or something like that. Yeah. Talking over the noise, that's so fatiguing. Okay, so yeah, the, the, the disruptions to your normal body clock, the very, very dry air, because so, okay, you're flying at 35,000 feet. The air up there is really dry. Now it's warm when it's brought in, and they do have some filters to kind of scrub out any chemicals and things like that. But it's still, what, maybe 5% humidity or something like that. It's very, very dry air. And typically, you know, on a long flight especially, the turnover of the air in the cabin, so sometimes there's higher CO2 levels, that's why you get sleepy. You know, you have lower oxygen levels because they pressurize the plane to 7,500 feet, and then there's more CO2 than normal. So that's why you feel sleepy. Um, two simple ways you can maintain hydration. Water bottle, water bottle, water bottle, that's good. What's another one? Huh? Drinking fruit juice. Yeah. Hydrating foods like Yeah, there are hydrating foods too. Um, potatoes, sweet potatoes, pumpkin, Squash, gourds basically. A lot of the gourds and uh, celery, of course. A lot of your vegetables have quite a bit of water, um, but also, you know, we don't need to do it too much here. But if you live in a drier place like Western Texas, and you know, a humidifier, either in your house or in your bedroom. No, yeah. humid. Well, but you've got to be doing the hydration. Mm -hmm. I mean, humid is humid. It's a uh, dry venison. It's a uh, it's a mucolytic. It thins your mucus. It's in a lot of the cough syrups. It's a, medication. it's a medication, and it does typically make your body actually produce more mucus. And as long as you hydrate, it is it basically has a thinning effect upon your mucus. Um, but if you don't hydrate it's not gonna be helpful. So you have to really up your hydration as well as using that. What type of rest is necessary immediately after performance? 
Yeah, say that louder. Ahem, a warm down and then vocal rest. Very good. Yeah, and of course that's the time when all your friends are like, hey, come on, let's go out. Let's that's true, yeah. <laughs> Even if it's your family, let's go to a nice restaurant. And still, they want you to talk, mm -hmm. they want to ask you questions. Mm -hmm. You've seen that aunt that you haven't seen in six months, or, you know, or your what boyfriend's in town. And he, you know, and then there's all sorts of noise in the background, you know, with the <laughs> restaurant. Yeah. Three surefire cures for stage fright. Preparation. Preparation. Uh, letting go of perfection. Letting go of perfection. Those are all good. And mental exercises are pretty much the tie for the day, right? But the first one, preparation. If you're prepared, that tends to help a lot of nerves, right? Yeah. I'm not sure there is a surefire cure for stage fright. Because there are some people who, oh, no yeah. matter how prepared, no matter how calm you are initially, you get up there and it just does not, you, you've got the yeah. stage fright. Like uh, Lily Pons, she was like famous mm -hmm. for, I mean, she was she's an incredible color tourist soprano, but before every performance, she got so nervous, she threw up. Yeah. And sometimes when you have, well, think about Barbara Streisand, Amazing, beautiful voice, but quit because she, she stopped quit. performing in public for because many she years. Had such horrible straight mm -hmm. stage fright, and you could hear. I mean, when she sang, she was prepared and yeah. had a gorgeous voice. But yeah, mm -hmm. George Shirley, um, who incidentally I got an email from yesterday. That was great. Um, first American, uh, African American male leading artist at the Metropolitan Opera. Um, and a very, very nice man. He taught at University of Michigan forever. And he was one of the uh, master teachers when I was in the NATS intern program. Um, he told me, he was good friends with Franco Corelli, the famous um, kind of uh, dramatic about Italian tenor, back in the 1960s and 70s. And so George would be either his cover, his understudy, or in operas where there were two tenors. Sometimes George would be kind of the supporting tenor and Franco would be doing the, the really leading role. So like they would do Pagliacci together and Corelli would be singing Canio mm -hmm. and George would be singing Beppe. And he said Corelli's nerves were so overpowering for him. He would be literally Backstage, and they're like, Franco, come on, you know, wow. it's time. And I'm like, I can't do it, George, I can't. He's like, come on. And he would just like take him by the arm, and they'd be at the edge of the stage, and they, he was like shaking. You know, he's like, Franco, Franco, smile, smile. <laughs> and, they, and he would just literally have to push him out on stage. And then once he got out there, he was magnificent, you know? Mm. He was electrifying on stage, and his voice was just gigantic, you know? But he literally would have to almost push him out on stage, and he had a, he had a reputation of canceling at the very last minute. In fact, Placido Domingo made his stage debut at the Met because Corelli canceled mm. at 7.25 for an eight o'clock curtain. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because he would be warming up, and he would say well, his voice wasn't up to snuff, and he would cancel. Yeah. So he um, he had he had a huge international career, and he was, you know, he was the leading tenor in in those kind of roles at the Met and just about anywhere else for a, a, a nice long period of time, you know, 10, 15 years. And opera companies put up with it because when he was good, he brought people in. You know, people came to hear that amazing voice. But he had a big time with, and there are a lot of singers. I mean, Renee Fleming makes no yeah. bones about it in her autobiography, talking about dealing with nerves and anxiety and depression and so on. Yeah. So. It's a big deal. So 
So what's what's the third surefire way to get rid of sage bread? Um, mm -hmm. In preparation, releasing expectations. Counseling. A growth mindset. Yeah. yeah, a growth mindset yeah. is the better way to be. Okay. Let's. Okay. So let's pick a register. And um, it'd be so great if I could write it down. Um, a male register. So what is unique? Okay, pick one. Well, so in males, okay. So let's talk about um, range-wise. Where does falsetto occur? In men. In men. Uh, uh, like ten or above high C. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, but I mean, I you can, can sing say falsetto down low. Um, okay, I was thinking like not today. Depend on on what voice type. Well, you know, really men can sing falsetto way down into the range where they also can sing chest, but then they can go higher in falsetto than they could in any other register. Okay, um, so the physiology. What's going on when we sing in falsetto? We've been very silent today. <laughs> muscle is active and which muscle is not so active? Uh, okay. Catherine, come up and be my be my muscle. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I need some push-ups last night. So. Oh, okay. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. Just in deference to your not getting sick. Okay. Oh. oh. Okay, so here's chest <laughs> voice. Here's chest voice, right? And my bicep Bulk stop and everything. Okay, and now here's falsetto. Okay. So that's the CT pulling, right? TA is most active in chest. Falsetto. Okay. Oh, I had that backwards today when we were talking. The cricothyroid. So, right, the cricothyroid is your long ways lengthener of your vocal folds, and it's most active in falsetto in men. That's yeah. why. Oh, it has layers. That's why. That's why I did the wrist grab rather than. Thank lift. you. Thank you. Okay, acoustics, falsetto. What about falsetto? What's typically going to be the strong harmonic if I, if I'm singing falsetto up reasonably high? Probably the first. The fundamental. Yeah. So I'm gonna probably be doing a lot of those same tuning strategies that a woman would use yeah. going up into her higher range. So if I teach a counter tenor, I'm going to be teaching him more like a mezzo soprano probably. I'm not going to be using the vowels that work really good for a tenor or something like that because he's singing much higher. Plus, vocal fold wise, the cricothyroid being the dominant thing is like a woman singing, mm -hmm. you know, not in chest voice. So it only makes sense from an acoustical as well as a physiological standpoint. You would train a countertenor if he's singing, you know, probably above D, above middle C or something like that, and he's singing not in chest, he's singing using his falsetto. You're going to treat him like you would a female singer who has that same range. So, all right, um, dun, 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 dun. what else? Sensations, okay, well you're the only other guy in here. What's it feel like when you sing falsetto? Pretty, pretty.
pretty effortless, right? Yeah. It's just like, no problem. Yeah, I can do things in falsetto, you know, it's like, I can never do that in any other register, you know? Right. But then you end up down to just almost nothing and stuff. Yeah, you guys have a big advantage of, of, over us with <laughs> finesse things you can do. Um, okay, musical application. So if we're singing falsetto, why would we use falsetto in a man? Expressive. For expressive things, I mean, Kulink, there's some songs where he, he writes in falsetto. You know, uh, yeah. it's Fet uh, Galant too, I believe. There's a spot in there where it's been dum 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 dum. And then he's got a high note that's just out of nowhere, and he's written over it, you'll see, you know, falsetto that he wrote, it, wrote in. That's the quality he wanted. Or a very soft, high note that a guy couldn't do unless he, you know, went into falsetto. What about a musical theater? Expressive. expressive things. I was also gonna say period. Ah, men, true. Because men will sing in falsetto if they're countertenors, and that's a period Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, well, it, it is, but also, I mean, Benjamin Britten wrote for countertenor. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, Oberon in Midsummer Night's Dream, and uh, there's a countertenor role in Death in Venice. I can't remember the character's name. Yeah, but are all those, all of those are contemporary, right? Yeah, and in fact, a lot of contemporary composers have written stuff with yeah. countertenor in mind. Juliana Hall just had a song cycle. She had written it for Brian Asawa, and then he died, and Daryl Taylor, I think, um, did the premiere of it. So, uh, Stravinsky wrote, uh, well, Bob of the Turk is often sung by mezzos, but it can be sung by uh, a countertenor to great effect. Um, you do what you're imitating, like a child. Oh yeah, and as a teacher, as a male teacher, if I'm demonstrating things for uh, a female student, um, particularly one who's younger and maybe more thrown off if I don't demonstrate in her octave, yeah. <laughs> Or you know that they need that lighter quality rather than my manliness. Okay. Well, he used to demonstrate for me all the time. Impossible. Yeah, got, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got really good at it. Um, <laughs> let's go on. We may come back to a female register. Okay. Let's take somebody. Voice classification. Um, Daniela, why don't you just come up here? We're gonna talk about your voice for a few minutes and make you feel all self-conscious. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about Danielle's voice. Do any of you need to hear her sing or have you heard her? Okay, do you feel like singing just a little bit? Um, okay, have you sung any today? Okay, what's your favorite warm-up thing to do first off? Um, bubbling. Yeah. Other than bubbling, okay. what else? Um, uh, I do another one where it's like staying on one note, me, me, ma, ma, mu, me, me, me. Okay, <coughs> sure. Well, let's just do a couple and we'll just kind of move it around. You guys can kind of listen to your voice, okay? Go for it. Me, me, ma, ma, mu, li, le, la, la, lu.